Let's move on to a movie now that's one of the most brilliant, weird, and unusual American documentary films I've seen in a long time. Roger Ebert was the definitive mainstream film critic in American cinema. He has been writing for half of the history of feature films. Roger was a mature writer early on. He's written over a dozen books. He wrote a novel. He won a Pulitzer Prize. How on earth did Roger Ebert write Beyond the Valley of the Dolls? Boobs. I've been talking a lot with documentary filmmakers lately, and the one thing I've realized is that, you know, when you start a project, you never know how it's going to end up. And, you know, and I was just curious for you, Steve, um, uh, when you started this documentary, how different was it from what you envisioned it as, be as being when you, when, when it, as it was? I mean, in some ways, it is what I set out to do, which is I wanted to get my arms around Roger's life story, which is <laughs> quite, a, quite a tale to tell. Uh, and I wanted to set it against his everyday life in the present. And, but what that was going to be was him going to critic screenings, Chaz and Roger throwing dinner parties, you know. And, and the goal with that was to see how vibrant his life was despite all he had been through in, in the last six or seven years. And the film is all that too. I mean, it is that. It's just that we never got to film those dinner parties and critic screenings because he was in the hospital rehab for most of that time. But yet, I felt like the deeper thing that I wanted to capture is there. And, and then, of course, most poignantly at all, is the way in which he showed how to die with a kind of dignity and grace and even sense of humor intact, which was remarkable. Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel were the most powerful critics of all time. The perfect matching of opposites. Even though Roger wrote Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, Gene lived the life. These were towering figures clashing. It was, I'm going to crush you. You give Benji the Hunter a positive review. That's totally unfair because you realize they almost didn't care what anyone else thought as long as they could try to persuade the other. And, um, and one of the things I really liked is we also get a good look at Gene Siskel and we get to look at his life as well. And I was curious, Jazz, uh, can you tell us more about your relationship with Gene? Gene and I got along very well. Um, <laughs> I when when I, I would travel with uh, Gene and Roger, when they would do, when they would go on, um, you know, to festivals or when they went to do speeches or to do TV shows, and I was like their den mother. <laughs> Backstage, they were like little boys always asking, okay, who looks the best? I would look to see that their collars were straightened and everything, and when they would come off the stage, they would run back there and ask, okay, who was the best tonight? Who did the best? And you know, Roger would say, don't you ask her that, you know, she's supposed to tell me. And it was just, I mean, it was hilarious. I, I, I actually loved being with them. And um, we missed Jane so much when he passed away. You got a lot of filmmakers to participate in this documentary. You know, uh, Martin Scorsese, Warner Herzog, and Errol Morris, who Ebert all championed. Um, what was it like working with them? Well, all the filmmakers wanted to participate because of what Roger had meant to them, their careers, and in some cases, personally, you know, that, that the closeness that Martin Scorsese felt to Roger as a person, because both of them had kind of come up at the same time. Roger's first reviews sort of coincided with Scorsese's first films. Mm -hmm. They were both Catholic, which they bonded over. And, mm -hmm. and so, so to get a window into Roger's role in their careers and in some cases his personal impact on them was great. I could have interviewed um, a hundred directors on impact, you know, of, of him on the career. In fact, I'm sure there's a, a, probably a, a bunch of directors out there when they see the movie are going like, well, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm just curious for Chaz, for you, how does it feel watching um, this documentary now? You know, I, I go through a uh, a gamut of emotions from sadness um, to, it's also the film is so life affirming uh, and also hilarious the the bits with Gene and Roger just sometimes I you know one once I really laughed until I was breathless uh, and I also cried until I was breathless as well so it's it's I think it's such a gift this film thank you is, thank yeah. you I have to ask, do you two have any favorite reviews that Cisco Lieber did on the TV show? So many. Mm -hmm. So many that we can't just start naming them off mm -hmm. the top of our 
they were together for 23, almost 24 years. You can pick almost any show they did and it would still seem fresh today. Yeah, I think that was the thing. In, in working on the film, I went back and looked at a lot of shows to find, you know, impossible tasks, which moments we were going to feature. And the thing that st stood out to me was, in some cases, I'm looking at a show that's 30 years old, almost. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, definitely. No, no, the, almost over, 40 yeah, years old. Right. And I'm like, this is great television. I mean, today it's great television mm -hmm. because it was smart and it was insightful and it was real. These two guys were really discussing movies with each other. And they had a chemistry that you can't buy. No, you but, can't buy. And it's been tried numerous times <laughs> since. He made it failed. possible for a bigger audience, a wider audience, to appreciate cinema as an art form, because he really loved films. For me, the movies are like a machine that generates empathy. It lets you understand hopes, aspirations, dreams, and fears. It helps us to identify with the people who are sharing this journey with us.